joining us. Uh, for those of you that have been doing this with us now for a few weeks, welcome back. Uh, if you've not uh, been with us before, I'll just say uh, by way of introduction that this is uh, an experiment, uh, and there are so many experiments these days, but this is something that the SBCC Foundation began just a few weeks ago as a way to really pull back the curtain on some of the fantastic work that happens at the college that so many people don't get to see. Uh, unless you're a student, uh, certainly most of the work that our faculty does uh, isn't visible on a day-to-day -day basis, and many of the programs and the other services provided on our campus uh, may not be familiar to everyone. So we have decided that this is a wonderful platform, uh, though we all know we were forced into this, but here we are, we're embracing the moment, and, uh, and it's been a, a wonderful opportunity. We've had our, our superintendent president join us, we've had the head of the well and our mental health teams join us, we've had the head of our EOPS and equity programs join us, and today, um, apropos to the moment, we have uh, one of our true in-house experts at the college, uh, Dr. Matthew Mooney joining us. Uh, he is someone who has, he dived into online learning long before anyone had their hand uh, forced or their arm twisted. Uh, he believes uh, and knows from experience that it's actually an incredibly useful tool. Obviously, it's not a brand new idea, uh, but the speed with which most of us have had to adapt to this, this new world has been shocking for many. Uh, so we reached out to Matt uh, to ask him if he would maybe share with us some of what he shares in, in one of his regular courses, which actually is the, this very subject to try to help uh, folks who may not be so familiar uh, with this platform and this, this mode of educating uh, with how to do it and do it well. Um, he does a few things. So let me give you a brief, brief introduction to Matt. He, he joined our faculty uh, in 2006 as a full-time professor in our history department. Um, he also serves on the California Online Education Initiative as a reviewer. So he does this on a broad scale. Uh, helping other faculty to do this work well. Uh, he got his bachelor's at UCLA, he got his doctorate at UC Irvine, uh, and that very same year he joined us as faculty. So I'm really happy to have one of our true experts, uh, Dr. Matt Mooney, with us today. And, and you can rest assured, uh, Matt, when this is all over today, I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna ask you how we really could be doing this a lot better. So <laughs> with that as introduction, uh, please welcome uh, Professor Mooney. Hello, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I'd like to thank the City College Foundation, Jeff and his team, for the invitation. It's really an honor. Uh, it was also nice to have an excuse to comb my hair because uh, I haven't done that in about three months. <laughs> I even put a coat on. Uh, I still don't have pants, I'm wearing shorts. But um, I also want to take the opportunity before we move forward to give a, a shout out to thank our Faculty Resource Center, the FRC. Uh, the FRC does outstanding work uh, providing, um, providing support for instructors, especially uh, in pedagogy, teaching strategy, and on the technological side. They have gone above and beyond, uh, especially during this pandemic emergency to help everyone make the transition to remote learning. They've really, really been fantastic and they are a, a, a gem um, at the college. I especially want to thank the uh, co-director of the FRC, uh, David Wong, uh, for all his help and support over the years because David is going to be leaving us. He's retiring at the end of June and his insight his expertise and his empathy will be really difficult to replace. So uh, David, if you are watching this, we will miss you. Uh, thank you for all your help over the years. We appreciate it. Um, so first off, I just have a couple of um, prepared remarks. Uh, so uh, please excuse me if I read them. And then uh, what I wanted to do is actually a little, a little bit of why, how I often lead my, my in-person classes. I, I bring student writing into class and then we sort of uh, work through that writing um, at the same time we're working on our, our American history. So a couple of remarks first. I think it's really important to recognize the remarkable transition to uh, remote learning that SBCC accomplished in the middle of spring semester. Uh, as Jeff noted in the invitation to this presentation, the college successfully transitioned over 95% of our courses to online instruction within a week 
of Governor Newsom issuing his stay-at-home order on March 19. This is remarkable. Uh, it was a tremendous undertaking, and everyone at the college should be proud of their role in making it happen. The hard work and many extra hours invested by administrators, staff, and faculty enabled our students to complete the semester and move that much closer towards their academic goals. Um, that said, I think we should also acknowledge that the transition to remote learning was difficult, uh, sometimes messy, and understandably resented by many faculty and students because after all, online was not what most of them signed up for. And I think everyone agrees that requiring forcing uh, students to learn online and forcing instructors to teach online is not what's best. It's not ideal. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that point moving forward. Uh, for most instructors, right, their expertise is in the physical on-campus classroom. You know, interacting with students face-to-face, -face, seeing the gleam of understanding in their eyes when they've worked their way through challenging material, uh, that's what motivates instructors. That's what brings joy to their teaching. And it's hard for many instructors to imagine uh, how those experiences can be replicated on a computer in an online course. Uh, similarly, most of our students did not sign up to take online courses in the spring. Um, after our transition to remote learning, they missed the on-campus interaction with their teachers and their classmates, as well as the, the buzz, the excitement of just being on campus. After all, it is a beautiful campus. But despite these obstacles and disappointments, students and instructors pushed through and finished the semester. Looking forward, however, right, the rest of the summer and probably the fall semester at least will be online. And the prospect of an entirely online fall semester for many instructors and students, understandably, is not a happy one. Uh, they would very much like to get back to campus, back to their classroom as soon as possible. However, if this is not possible, I think we're fortunate to have the ability uh, to continue teaching and learning online. Hopefully, we can embrace it and make the most of it. Still, I understand and respect why many instructors and students view the prospect of an entirely um, online fall semester with great trepidation. How's this going to work, they wonder. Will I be able to teach with any effectiveness in an online course? Will I really learn anything if all of my courses are online, students wonder. Uh, teaching and learning just won't be the same. And this is true. An online course is not the same as an on-campus course. And it is fundamentally different. Now, there's no getting around that. Uh, and I think one mistake we make as instructors, and we should avoid, is attempting to simply replicate online exactly what we do in a face-to-face -face classroom. It's just, it's not going to work. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that online education is inherently inferior. After all, in a good online course, there's, quote unquote, no back row. In other words, students can't hide, right? Everybody interacts. Everybody participates repeatedly and in depth multiple times each and every week. So as I said, it's different. Um, instructors, as instructors, we have to reconsider our approach in some fundamental ways. We have to be willing to try something new. Frankly, I, I'm really not too worried about this. City College has good teachers. Many of them are great teachers. I've seen them. They've got skills. They're smart, insightful, innovative. And even if they're not thrilled about teaching online, um, they will figure out a way to make this work. In fact, um, I'm leading a course right now for my fellow instructors. It's called Teaching with Humanizing Technology. It's a four-week online workshop made possible by FRC co-director, um, Dr. Elizabeth Immel, my uh, former history department colleague. And in this course, I've got instructors from all across the campus, different disciplines, uh, wildly different levels of experience with online education, 
And despite all, the, all of these differences, they are all embracing the opportunity to try something new and to do the best they can on behalf of their students, uh, even though they may be uncomfortable. Uh, even though it forces us to reconsider some fundamental assumptions that we may have held for years, maybe for decades, about the quote unquote right way to teach. And I love leading courses like this because my colleagues prompt me to reconsider my own ideas about teaching. And I like to think, make me into a better teacher. Uh, somebody who's never taught online before can just as easily make me reconsider my assumptions as someone who has decades of online experience. And here's the thing, despite the very different perspectives my colleagues bring to the discussion, in spite of the very distinct challenges different disciplines have to address in the online environment, the one constant that all of them reinforce again and again is this. A successful online course seeks to build connection between instructors and students. Students need to know that there's a real person on the other end of that internet connection. They need to know that there is someone invested in their academic success. It's not a computer teaching the class. I'm not a robot. There's a real person, a real teacher with a deep well of expertise and empathy teaching the course. Indeed, the research indicates that this is absolutely crucial. According to a study published by Jaggers and Shu in 2016, the only online course design element shown to relate positively and significantly with student grades in online community college courses is the quality of instructor student interactions. So artificial intelligence, right? Computers, in spite of all of the mind blowing advances we've witnessed over the past decade, computers cannot as of yet demonstrate the empathy, the care and concern for our students that we can. Uh, computers can't do that yet, at least. So the question is, how do we demonstrate these qualities in an online course? How will our students know that there's a real human being teaching the course, not a robot? How can real learning happen in an online course? Uh, how do we demonstrate, frankly, that online learning is not a joke? There's still a lot of skepticism out there. Um, how do we demonstrate that an online course is not or doesn't have to be a cold, isolating, alienating experience, one to be simply endured until the end of the semester? Uh, that it's not simply a correspondence course that could have been accomplished 100 years ago via the US mail. So rather than continuing to lecture to you, to sermonize about online learning, what I'd like to do instead is to address some of the most common objections to online learning. Now, uh, some of these skeptical critiques are legitimate, powerful. After all, as I acknowledged, uh, online education is different. It cannot, as of yet, replicate the immediacy and spontaneity of a face-to-face -face physical on-campus classroom. Again, however, that does not mean that it, it is necessarily inferior uh, and I hope by addressing some of these critiques of online education, I hope to demonstrate that in some small measure at least, uh, how we might humanize our online teaching, how we might demonstrate not only to our expertise as instructors, uh, but demonstrate real empathy to our students, for our students. Um, how can we show them that there's a real person at the other end of that wireless connection who cares about and is invested in their success? So what I'd like to do now is uh, share my screen with you all and go through some of these common uh, objections to online learning. So let me try and share my screen. You never know if this is going to work. Are we good? All right. So uh, let's start here, okay? 
Online education, I, I love, love the scare quotes. Um, online education is the biggest scam there is in higher education. The seat time in a traditional class is the very soul of education. And the dialogue between teacher and student means that the exchange of ideas and views can thrive. Okay, so let's, let's not generalize, okay? Um, saying online education is the biggest scam there is in higher education, you know, that may sound cool when you're shooting the breeze with the good old boys down at a coffee shop Saturday morning, but it's, it's inaccurate to overgeneralize like this. Um, as I've said, and I'll probably say again a number of times, online education is different, but it's not necessarily inferior, right? It depends upon the instructor, the course, the LMS with the learning management system, which for us is Canvas, um, the setting. And here's what I mean. When I was in grad school, um, I was very lucky, right? I had the privilege to spend my days sitting around a small conference table with fellow grad students, uh, bouncing ideas off of some of the experts in my field. That was amazing. Um, it's an opportunity I feel very, very lucky to have had. Now, can an online course replicate that experience? No, it can't. However, I also remember um, a very different environment as a student. Uh, maybe you guys do too, right? I remember sitting around in a big lecture hall, 100, 200, 300 people, straining to hear some professor reading off a yellowed page of notes that he scribbled up 20 years ago. Uh, boring, detached, couldn't wait to get back to his or her research. Now, can an online course deliver a superior, superior educational experience to something like this? Absolutely, without a doubt. Um, so let's be careful, number one, of overgeneralizing. Moving on, right? Here's another one we often hear, right? Sitting, online education sells the student short. Sitting in front of a computer, watching a video, or a one-way streaming uh, webcast is a passive activity. Um, now, I agree that sitting in front of a computer, watching a video, or a one-way streaming uh, webcast is a passive activity. Uh, this, no doubt, would sell our students short. It would also be mind-numbingly boring. So here's the thing that's important to remember. Um, that's not what online education is. At least um, that's not what it should or could be. Now, I review online courses, as, as Jeff mentioned, for the state uh, through the online education in initiative. And the fact is most of the courses I review are designed effectively. They incorporate relevant, valid content. They have meaningful activities and assessments, and they're taught by talented instructors who foster participation and collaboration amongst their colleagues and their students, sorry. Um, now, have I reviewed quote unquote bad online courses? Sure, a few, they're out there. And I think they give, um, they give online education a bad name. But let's be honest, were all of the classes that you took on campus amazing? Mine weren't, right? So you'll find bad classes online occasionally, just as though you will find bad classes face-to-face uh, -face occasionally. Now, moving into sort of the, the nuts and bolts of things to try and give you a sense of, of the way online education actually works or can work. Um, another common critique of online education runs something like this. Look, online office hours of the professor may be inconvenient, uh, at inconvenient times for many students. Interaction with the professor has to be through uh, email, which is often indirect and impersonal, right? If you're old enough, you remember this. Remember, you've got mail. Everything through email. Uh, and there is this, this impression that many people have that it's impossible 
to reach your instructor online. You send an email, you might not hear back from the guy or the, or the woman for a week. Um, let me give you an example from just a few days ago that that is not, or at least it doesn't have to be the case. In my courses, let me show you real quick here, the front page of my syllabus. Uh, this is for a course that's gonna be taught in the fall, an eight week um, US History class 101. And one of the things I like to do, sure if you can see it, I like to give my students the option to text me. And um, that's not my actual number, it's not a real number, it's basically a fake number created just for academic purposes. But when students text me at that number, it comes into my personal uh, phone, my iPhone. So what this does is it enables me to get back to students immediately um, if I choose to do so. And so as an example of how far you could take this, I was, um, I was on a walk, as I often am, a few days ago. Uh, because oftentimes I'm actually working on my courses on my phone because I can, I can um, grade things on my phone. I can leave uh, memos, audio and video memos for my students from my phone. But anyway, I got a text from a student and the text basically said, uh, Professor, I'm stuck on this assignment. I need some help. Um, when would you be available to help me? And I had a, a Zoom link in my phone, uh, hidden in my email. So I texted him right back with the link. And I said, we can talk right now. Click the link. And he did. And within 30 seconds of him sending that email, we were discussing the issue that he was having with the course and resolved it, right? So for any instructors out there who are freaking out and saying, dude, you got to send boundaries. That's insane. Um, somebody reaching out to you on a Saturday morning while you're on your walk. I'm not saying this is what you should do or have to do. I just bring it, bring it up as an example of what's possible. That this idea that we're completely disconnected from our students and it's impossible for them to get a hold of us is, is just not true. And for anybody who's interested, um, uh, right now I'm using Zoom to communicate with students, but I've been experimenting a little bit with something called uh, Google Meet, which the folks at the FRC are real big fans of, at least for one-on-one -on -one or small group meetings. So you might consider uh, checking that out as well, Google Meet. Um, so next one that I often hear. Students expect online courses to be very easy and to require little time. And then they're surprised when uh, good online courses actually demand quite a bit of time and effort. And uh, the fact is that, that this is often true, right? Uh, some students still today in 2020 often assume that online courses are a joke, uh, an easy A with little or no work involved. Uh, they have this perception sometimes that all they've got to do is, is make some good guesses on a multiple choice sort of electronic Scantron form make the good guesses, fill in some little bubbles, and, and they're done. They can check out, they get the grade. And they're, they're not thrilled when they figure out that this is not the case, that online courses can actually be fairly rigorous. So one thing that I try and do right up front is I try and clarify for students expectations, what they're gonna have to invest into this class to be successful because it's it's not a joke and what i try and do is i send out i begin sending out information up to two weeks ahead of time uh, so that students can plan and actually so they can decide whether or not they actually want to stay in the course and so in my syllabus i lay this out as clearly as i can how many hours per week they're going to have to invest in this course to be successful um, and recognizing that students today, right, they have very busy, very complicated lives, uh, family obligations, work obligations, they're trying to have a social life. Uh, so it's important that they know right off the bat what's going to be uh, expected of them. Another way I try and do this that 
uh, students often uh, respond well to, maybe because it's coming from fellow students and not from some old professor guy, is that every semester, at the end of the semester, I, I survey students and I ask them, you know, what do you know now that you wish you'd known at the beginning of the semester? Basically, what kind of advice can you give to next semester students to help them succeed? And um, I often get some really, really good advice uh, from successful students. I take that advice, I curate it, I put it into this, um, this little form. This is called a Padlet. It's a really nice way to be able to prevent, uh, present student work. Oftentimes you could, like if students are doing uh, video assignments, uh, research projects, you can build their YouTube links right into this Padlet. It's, it's a great tool. Anyway, this Padlet is in the next semester, it's one of the very first thing new students encounter. And their assignment, basically their, one of their introductory assignments is read through this, find the best advice and tell me why. And tell your fellow students why <laughs> they need to pay attention. And this is great because it makes it real for them. It's not me telling them what I expect of them and how much time they need to be reading and writing. That's easy to ignore. I think uh, for a lot of folks, but when it's coming from their fellow students, uh, they tend to pay attention and, and frankly, they, they appreciate it. Um, I also clarify uh, another little trick that's useful on a number of levels. The very first week of the semester or even before the semester starts, I survey my students and I have them uh, filling out a simple Google form. These really come in handy. If you've never messed around with Google Forms before, you should check it out if you're ever trying to uh, collect uh, contributions from a large group. They can enter the data into this form, boom, and it shows up immediately. You can show it on a, on a screen, you can show it on people's forms, it's great. But the way I use it at the beginning of the semester, one of the things I do is again, I sort of lay out for them the expectations. And I ask them, considering what this course is going to ask from you, how are you going to manage? Do you have a plan? Do you have a strategy? Tell me how you're going to do it. And not to say that they have to stick through that, stick to that, but at least it um, it encourages them to think this through. How are they going to succeed in the class? It's, it's not good enough to simply have good intentions. They need to have a plan. They need to have uh, a strategy. And so there's a number of, of little tools or tricks you might adopt uh, ahead of time, right? Sending it out a week, two weeks before the classes begin so that students know what's coming, so they're not surprised. Um, okay, what about this? This is actually from somebody in my humanizing online learning class. My daughter doesn't know what the professor looks like, sounds like, or what she cares about. She has no idea if the professor cares about her success. The course is just a series of exercises, and it's hard to figure out how the course website works. It's confusing. So, um, online course designers, one of the things they emphasize is that you should be sharing who you are with your students. Now, those of us who are teachers or those of you who are leaders, you know, understand that that's, that's pretty straightforward. That's what you do. But sometimes this, this gets lost in the transition to online learning uh, because, you know, how do you, how do you share who you are in an online course? Well, one of the ways you can do it is when you build a, uh, they call them liquid syllabi these uh, syllabi that are set up more like a, a web page. So for one thing, they render really nicely on a phone, on a mobile device, uh, which frankly is where a lot of our students are living these days. They're living on their phone. So it renders nicely on a phone, but one of the great things about these liquid syllabi is that you can embed all kinds of media into the syllabi. So built right into the syllabus, you can... Hello, everyone. Welcome to SPCC History Online. You can introduce yourselves. And they also say, you know, if you got pets or kids, make sure they're in the video because students tend to like that. 
uh, especially if they're they're tugging on you, pulling you, making chaos around you. Um, this tends to humanize who you are. Furthermore, um, one of the things I like to do in the very first week, it's not only the instructor who can humanize themselves to the students, let students know who they are, uh, students themselves have the opportunity to share who they are, not only in, you know, in, a, in a written document, but one of the first assignments I have in my class is asking students to reflect on that Padlet I showed you guys, you know, what's the best advice given to you from last semester, and at the same time, introduce who they are and do it in a recording. And in Canvas, it's actually pretty simple. Um, you go reply, right? You go record media. Check, check, one, two, three, it's Professor Mooney. Check, check, one, two, three, it's Professor Mooney. So when, when the interface is that simple and it's that easy for students to share who they are, what's important to them, and to share not only their voice if they choose, but also their video so that students, their fellow students know who they are, I think this goes a long way to helping to humanize the course and again, a, a little bit more before I leave this behind, because I think it's important. In terms of um, this, this comment right here, it's hard to figure out how the course website works. For those instructors out there who are thinking about, you know, or having to make this transition to online learning, I think it's really important to imagine what your course website looks like from your student's perspective the very first time that they um, click into it. Because we live with these sites for weeks on end, sometimes months on end, and we take it for granted. Of course, we know how it works, but imagine how things look to a student the very first time they enter your class. Do they even know where to get started? Do they know how to find things? Are they just gonna stumble around and try and figure it out on their own? So one thing that I always recommend to folks is to build a very simple uh, navigation video. For instance, something like this. Hello everyone, this brief video will demonstrate how to navigate through our course website. And all that is, it's a, it's a screen capture um, through, let me show you here. This is really cool, it's called Screencastify and it's built right into the, the Chrome web browser. And it's one or two clicks, you can record whatever's on your screen and you can lead students step by step through your website, show them where to find things, where are the readings, how do they turn the work in. It's, it's super helpful for students, especially the first time they've ever uh, clicked into your class. And then one other example of the way that I like to use media in my class uh, to humanize it, that's the word I'm using these days. I have these assignments called reflections, and don't worry, I won't go too deep into this. I just wanna give you a sense of what's possible here. In these reflection assignments, students are taking what they've learned in the class, the impact the class has had on them, good or bad, oftentimes they're disturbed by some of the things we're learning. And they're discussing that with somebody outside of the class, with a community member, a family member, and they're bouncing those ideas off of what we're learning in the class. So everything's not just confined to this little academic environment. It's basically encouraging them to go outside of the class to somebody they, they, they're close to that they trust and say, does this matter, this stuff I'm learning? Why is it relevant? Do you care? Why should it matter? And then they're taking that and they're coming back to the course and they're recording this reflection. And the focus of the reflection is they're, they're discussing, they're, they're recording um, basically their reflections on this discussion they had with somebody outside of the class and then their, their classmates are peer reviewing that. So long story short, there are real tangible ways that you can humanize these courses, that you can make yourself more real to your students, that they can get a better sense of who their classmates are. Now, 
you might say, well, that's, that's just not the same. That's not the same thing as being in class together. And you know what? You're right. It's different. Um, but as I keep saying again and again and again, just because it's different doesn't mean it's necessarily inferior. It doesn't mean you can't reach, that you can't achieve the goals that you set out for your students to reach. You just have to rethink how you go about it. And honestly, um, if, you, if you haven't been able to tell already, I mean, I, I love this stuff. I love teaching. I love, you know, being in the classroom with students, but I also um, enjoy um, this sort of brave new world of online teaching. Well, I'm always learning something new. So long story short, I could go on and on and on and on and on telling you about the way I teach as you know, many teachers can because they love what they do. But I'm going to uh, stop now because I think I've gone on long enough and um, I'll let Jeff take this over. I'll stop my sharing. Thank you so much, Professor Mooney. Um, so I, I'm going to just predict that if we get a spike in online course enrollment after this, uh, we're coming back to you and blaming slash thanking you for that. I, I've, I haven't seen half of those tools, I'll, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. uh, a series of questions online. Now, there's a lot of faculty appropriately on this call right now. Um, but there's, there's one, I'm just going to jump right to the punchline for you. Mm -hmm. if, if a fellow faculty member uh, wants to ask you to give some feedback review a course, take a look. Is that something they can they can approach you for or, or approach the FRC formally? What's the best way to do that? Sure, you can text me. And, All right. Um, where's the, I should, uh, I should have my text number memorized and I, and I haven't. If you, uh, we'll find a way to get it to you. Right. All right, so the offer's out there for those of you that, that wondered whether uh, Matt could uh, give you some, some direct support. Um, now, let me, let me walk back a little bit. You, you mentioned at the beginning some of the uh, critiques that you hear uh, probably personally, directly, or, or through colleagues. Um, and, and maybe flip that on its head for a minute. What, what, are, the, what are the advantages? And what are the things about on online? Because you did this long before anyone was compelled to. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got some great tools there, clearly, that, that help uh, make that experience a better one. But what, what are some things that, that you think actually uh, online remote learning might be a way to better serve student or in, or in a particular context? Are there places and times where this is really uh, a great way to go and there's an advantage to it? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, before I, I talk about how it might benefit students, let me just mention that it can be a benefit for instructors. Um, because, you know, one of the, the knocks on online, one of the critiques that I didn't, didn't get to is that, you know, the online learning is not online teaching is not real teaching. It's this idea that you just set everything up, click a button, and the computer grades everything. And that's possible, you could set that up, but that, that is kind of a joke. I think that's why some uh, online courses get a bad reputation. The fact is, I think that to, to create a good, solid online course takes a lot of work. Um, as opposed to teaching a face-to-face -face course, there's a lot more work up front. Everything's front-loaded. Uh, before the course actually begins, like um, my fall courses, which begin mid-August, those are almost done already. I mean, I, I'm ready to go and I'll just be tinkering with those moving forward. And there's a lot of the work that goes in once the semester starts, but I'll tell you the big uh, advantage for instructors is flexibility. Um, you're not locked into having to be at a, at a particular place at a particular time every single week. And that can come really in handy. I remember after my son was born, it's not like I had any less work, any less teaching, but you know, if, if I needed to get up at, at four o'clock in the morning and work for four solid hours until he woke up, I could do it. If I needed to teach you know, from eight in the evening till midnight, till I passed out, I could do it. So it's that ability to time shift that's um, probably one of the biggest pluses for teachers. But I think it's similar for uh, students as well, right? Students, as I said before, students have busy, busy lives, complicated lives, and especially community college uh, students. We have this, I think we still have this stereotype in our mind that all college students live on campus and they're there for four years 
that's, that's just not the reality for most American college students. It's certainly not the reality for our students at City College. They're busy. And so I, would, I wouldn't say, yes, take all of your courses online, but having the, the ability to uh, take some of your courses online and fit those into your busy life is, is a, really a, a lifesaver for many students. They wouldn't be able to move forward without that flexibility. Um, I would also say, you know, it's great, I think, for students who aren't that comfortable participating in class because, you know, uh, college instructors, we, we really valorize that face-to-face that -face experience, those stimulating discussions, and that's, that's what we live for, right? But that's not, that's not every student. Not every student thinks that's fantastic. Um, they're, they're not comfortable, frankly, with participating in class. And in an online course, at least the way you can set it up, you don't hear from just those, you know, four or five students up front who are always eager to raise their hand and contribute to the discussion. In an online course, you hear from every student um, every week, multiple times a week. They can be peer reviewing each other's work. You can give individual feedback to each, uh, each student. And I think that in some ways, I know my students better in an academic sense in my online courses than I do in my face-to-face -face courses. So long answer to a short question. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna close the loop here. It's, it's appeared in the chat a few times, but I'm just gonna say it and we're recording this, so it's now permanently out there. Uh, but, but Professor Matt Mooney's text number, if you want his, his feedback, uh, is 805-699-5117, 805-699-5117. So uh, there you have it. So uh, those advantages you just outlined, um, that, thank you for that, because I think that is a big, um, there's, there's a lot to be made of that. What about the, the challenge of, I mean, what, I forget the statistics, X percent of human communication is nonverbal. I use it a lot, but I now forget what it is. Um, you know, I, I may be out there trying to facilitate a panel discussion, and now we have to do it online. And I know I personally feel like I lose a significant amount of the real-time feedback, just the small movements, facial expressions, you know, sort of the tone and intonation of how someone's interacting. How, what can you do as a, as a teacher, as a faculty member, to re either replace that or, or find other tools to get that real-time feedback from a, a room, or in this case, a group of students who may be engaging online? I, I suppose this happens primarily for real-time instruction. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, and I, I think I acknowledged this earlier, that for the most part, you're not going to be able to uh, replicate the, the immediacy, the spontaneity of an online course. Uh, however, right, there are tools that, in, that allow you to meet synchronously. Personally, I don't teach with Zoom. I'm a big fan of Zoom uh, for one-on-one -on -one meetings for small group meetings. The idea of trying to run, say, a, a traditional lecture on Zoom for an hour and a half to 30 or 40 students, that's, I just, I can't go there. I think there's, the technology's not quite there yet. I think it's too glitchy, problems with sound, background noise, students talking over each other. I'm not a big fan of, of trying to translate what happens in a face-to-face -face course exactly to Zoom. Um, but that said, for some disciplines, having that sort of interaction is absolutely crucial, like ESL, like foreign languages. And, you know, I'm learning more as an instructor about what some of my colleagues are able to accomplish. And um, I was hearing just this week from some foreign language instructors about how they're taking what are called breakout rooms in Zoom. I'm sure you guys, many of you are familiar with this. I'm not because I don't use Zoom that much, but they, they're breaking students into small groups into these breakout rooms. They're working, they're practicing their language and the instructor can bounce around from room to room providing assistance as it's needed. So uh, you can certainly approach the sort of uh, immediacy that, that you would have in a small group discussion. And I think uh, folks are figuring that out day by day. I know I've, I certainly know more about it now than I did even a, even a week ago. So I won't be surprised to see some really uh, significant advances over the next year, what people come up with. Great. 
Um, there's a few comments just coming in from from folks on here. So Robert uh, Brown was just saying that he actually feels more of a connection one on one to students uh, through a, an online format, oftentimes because of very much what you just mentioned, uh, Matt. But what about the the faculty member who says they feel like they still have the equivalent of a back of the room student, you know, the quiet student in an online environment? How do you find that, and, and sort of what tools do you use? to um, encourage inner engagement with, with students who aren't, again, naturally, in the same way they wouldn't naturally uh, engage with you maybe in a big lecture hall, they may not over, over a, a, a digital platform either. Well, uh, like I was saying, I don't require any synchronous sort of live class meetings. So for me, student interaction is, is structured differently. I do everything, well, a lot of the student interaction takes place on the discussion forum, discussion board, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Now, uh, discussion forums can be great and they can be terrible, right? Um, you really have to be intentional. You have to consider how you structure the assignments on the discussion forum. If you say something like, hey, um, you know, answer this question and then reply to two classmates, which is sometimes what you see. It, well, why reply to class to, to classmates? What's the point? What am I doing here? But I think there are ways to structure that that can make it um, really impactful, really meaningful. I know for me, every week, student, long story short, students are answering a question that they choose and then they're peer reviewing a classmate. And this this is something a lot of students are uncomfortable with, right? They don't like reviewing their peers, but I tell them, look, it's not just this class. It's when you get out of here and go on to a career, you're gonna have clients, patients, you know, they're gonna need feedback from you. You're gonna have to take feedback from them. Giving and receiving good authentic feedback is important. So um, they're doing a lot of peer review in my uh, discussion forums each and every week. And it's, it's highly structured right there. They're quoting from the assigned readings. They're building an argument. They're critiquing each other. And so, no, it's not going to be that, you know, stimulating off the cuff discussion that you might have in a face to face class. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't get good quality student interaction happening um, in an online course. All right, so I'm going I'm to ask you to get uh, futuristic with me now for a minute. Uh, we've heard lots of predictions about the impact of, of this pivot here during the pandemic. Uh, certainly, there's been complicating factors for many higher education institutions about falling enrollment, uh, students you know, not coming back or not completing the spring semester, a big debate about who's gonna be back in the classroom in the fall and will that be better or worse? Uh, what, if, you, if we go further out, if we go 10 years out, uh, what's your prediction of the role that, that online instruction might play? I mean, this is not, it's, it's a new, it's not a new platform, it's not a new strategy. Uh, you've obviously been doing this for, for many years. But the tools are changing, the technology is changing. Uh, what do you think we're going to look back on, you know, ten years from now, and say, you know, that because of that massive shift or that real that forced adaptation, here's the things that stuck, and everyone suddenly realized that these tools actually are good, or are even maybe even better, uh, or, or at least add to the possible set of tools that that faculty and students can use. You know, that's a really good question, and I should say that that I tend to think like this, right? I'm stuck on my teaching my class and I'm not a big, you know, broad thinker. But um, one of the things actually I worry about is that because of the, you know, chaotic nature of this transition we had to affect, that instructors who were already skeptical about online teaching, the, the chaos of the transition just reinforced the skepticism they already held. You know, and, and I think that's, that's too bad, that's, that's unfortunate, because I think if you had time and training and the ability to really set up a quality online course, I think a lot more instructors would come to enjoy teaching at least a few courses online. But I think for many instructors, they felt forced into it and they, they resent it, and understandably so. I think, um, getting to your question though, I'm sure we're always gonna have the classroom. Um, it's sort of like, remember, when television came in, in the late 40s, early 50s, folks were like, well, I guess nobody's going to the movies anymore. Why go to the movies when you can just sit home and, and watch the boob tube? Uh, but in fact, you know, movie theaters are still with us. I think 
if I had to guess, it's going to be more of what folks talk about now as, as blended learning or face-to-face -face learning. Uh, sorry, not face-to-face, -face, um, flipped learning, where students will have more options, which I think is good for students. They could, they'll be able to choose classes in a traditional format. They'll be able to choose classes that only meet online, or they may be able to choose these hybrid classes, these flipped classes, where maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, maybe once a month, they meet face-to-face -face, uh, with the instructor, with their classmates, and they can build that connection, that intimacy in the classroom, but they're doing the majority of their work, of the heavy lifting academically, on their own time. Um, and in fact, some of the research that I've seen is saying that that model is actually more effective than purely uh, traditional face-to-face -face or completely online. It's this, this mixture of the two modes that, that at least according to some research is academically the most powerful. So I can see that sort of option expanding further and further and further um, in the future. And frankly, I think that just gives students more, more options, more paths to reach whatever their academic goals are. And I think that's good for, for everybody. Well, this, now this may be a stretch, but what, what about the uh, economic implications? You know, right now, Santa Barbara City College is just one prime example of a, in this case, a 110-year-old you know, institution that has a, a, a physical plan, a, a structure that's really challenged. And of course, you know, bonds for the community colleges have been the traditional way that we, we improve that. Uh, state budgets for other public higher ed, private, private donations for private ed. What, what do you think the effect on the need or the, the need for the types of physical spaces might change uh, if we head to, to that sort of blended model? Did, are we actually approaching a time when we won't need as many large lecture halls and, and sort of traditional educational spaces? Or do you, do you think that really doesn't change in the long run, something like this? You know, well, you could answer this better than I can, but um, I'll just tell you, I love face-to-face -face teaching. I would never want that to go away, um, and I don't think it will. But certainly my ideas have shifted over the years because when I started teaching at City College, I really loved those big lecture halls, right? <laughs> I, li I liked being the center of attention. And I think I was, I was pretty entertaining. I could put on a show, I had lots of visuals, I had music, you name it, I, I did that thing. But after a while, I began to think, you know what, I like this, it's good for me, but I'm not sure if this is the most effective way to teach, I'm not sure this is the, the most impactful learning for students. So gradually, I, I moved away from teaching in these big uh, auditoriums because I didn't think it was all that effective, frankly. And so um, certainly, I think we're always gonna have a need or desire to meet together face-to-face -to, -face to learn and build connections. But to your point, I'm not so sure that those, those big spaces are going to be as, as necessary anymore. I, for me, I was, I was over it. Well, there's a lot to think about here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, Professor Matthew Moody, I want to give you the last uh, word here before we, before we sign off. Um, I know there's been a lot of appreciation expressed just watching the, uh, the chat, chat stream here. Uh, anything you want to say uh, to, to the group or anything you want to offer up uh, to the gathered gathered attendees today before we leave, aside from your text number, which if you want me to, I'll <laughs> but um, anything else just about how, where you see this going or what you, uh, what you might offer? Oh, you know, I suppose I'd, I'd, I'd honestly, for all the instructors out there, uh, City College, um, other institutions of higher ed, also K-12, um, I really want to commend them again for making that shift in the spring because if we would have just dug our heels in and said, no, I don't want to do it. It's not real teaching. Well, you know, where would that have left our students? So even if it was uh, supremely uncomfortable, difficult to make that transition, I think everybody uh, should be proud for have, uh, having the wherewithal to make that happen. And then moving forward, I would say, you know, if you had a difficult experience as an instructor in the spring, please um, 
don't judge online education on the basis of an emergency, right? It was, it was a mess, but we did it. Um, really consider moving forward, not just, you know, what works for you, because as I said, you know, I used to love being the center of attention in that big lecture hall, but then I figured out, you know, I don't know if that's the best thing for my students. So even if you don't, um, even if you can't embrace online learning, even if you think that it's just fundamentally inferior to that face-to-face -face experience, and I hear you, you know, think about our students. They have, as I've said many, many times already, they have difficult lives. They have complicated lives. They, they're being pulled in so many different directions that if you could offer a course on or two, um, a course that might enable someone to move along, to graduate, who wouldn't be able to, to work it into their schedule otherwise. Um, I think that would be a, a fantastic thing. And so for even fo for folks who uh, continue to be skeptical and maybe always will be skeptical, I would encourage you to give this another look moving forward because it, it could be incredibly helpful to our students. And that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Matthew Mooney, a professor of history here at Santa Barbara City College, as well as one of our leading thinkers and practitioners uh, and peer advisors uh, in online learning. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us and, and sharing what you know. Uh, you're going to get some calls and some texts after this, I predict, and uh, I take that as a good thing. Uh, on behalf of all of us at the Santa Barbara City College Foundation, thank you for joining us again this week. Uh, we will be back again next week. I feel like I'm hosting a television show now. Uh, <laughs> next week, uh, we will have actually a, a blended uh, presentation. Uh, one member from our arts faculty, studio arts faculty, one member from our, our sciences, uh, talking about what this, uh, this shift has meant for them and sort of how they're navigating this and the way that they're teaching differently in this moment. Uh, and you'll get some insight from a, another couple of our wonderful faculty members. So thank you all for joining us. Um, all of this can be found again at sbccfoundation.org. We record these, we post them, and uh, this will be up in just a, a day or two. And uh, we will hopefully see you all next week. Thank you all. Thank you.